Chapter 4, Confessions of a Workaholic. If it wasn't for Dad getting me this interview, I might just have been unemployed for the rest of my life. Okay, technically I'm still employed. Zara wasn't able to directly change the law and my boss, despite letting me go on the spot, still had to follow procedure. He called me the day after the fire to give me both a verbal and written notice. It was official. In just two weeks, I'd have no job. That's where Dad comes in. I'm not above admitting I cried every night until we figured out our way forward. Sina had been fed up with it. Apparently my sobbing was distracting her from her viewing, which is just code for being a nosy parker. On this particular day, she chose to watch Dad at work and clocks the advert stuck on the bulletin board that stated they were hiring. She told me I told Dad and he told his boss, Mr Merricks, who was more than happy to offer me an interview. And now it's here, interview day. Dad drove me to his work building fairly early. Early is on time, on time is late. He gives me his standard dad-like advice. I look up at the tall office complex. It's nothing special, but it feels grand. You can tell just from the sights of it that this is a place where important decisions are made. Morning jacket? Dad nods to the receptionist. I look at him confused and he laughs. Oh, that's Jack. We call him jacket because of the slightest chill he puts on his big puffer jacket. Can't relate. My blood bending ensures I never get cold. Dad takes us over to the elevator and hits the up button. The doors begin to open slowly as we hear footsteps running up behind us. Hold the door! I turn to look for the familiar voice. Hold the... door? He stops in front of us and places his hands on his hips. Not my Huey getting into the same elevator as me. What are you doing here? How the devil are you? He laughs. I work here. Why the hell are you here, Chase? Chase was my dad's ex years ago before I was born. He's made quite a name for himself in the porn industry. What? My dad asks for clarification as Chase steps through the doors. I'm here to shoot a scene. Merricks is letting me use one of the empty offices on the fifth floor because I'm shooting the scene of his son. My dad places his palm to his face as the doors close before us. Chase raises an eyebrow as he looks over to me, finally acknowledging my presence. Charles, what a pleasant surprise. My dad presses the button for the fifth floor and Chase goes wild with excitement. Stop. You are not telling me you work on the fifth floor. What a blooming great coincidence. Now I'm starting to see why Dad is always referring to Chase as his annoyingly lovable ex, because as much as this overexcitement is annoying me, it's certainly working to erase my nerves. We all get off on the fifth floor, just moments later, and Chase is greeted by a short young man who I recognise all too well. It's not often you meet one of your favourite porn stars on your way to a job interview. Bobby, this is my ex-boyfriend and his son Charles. Bobby Brasscock sticks his hand out to me and I shake it with a bit too much excitement. I can't help it, Bobby is one of the hottest men on earth, and that's not me snubbing Joey. We're both in full agreement. We even watch his stuff together, though I don't think we'll be watching his next scene with my dad's ex. That would be awkward. Actually, it would be mortifying. Especially when you factor in that Chase is dating David, who is the son of Grandad Ken and Grandma Joe, essentially making him my uncle. So my dad's ex is technically my uncle as well, or at least he will be if he marries David. My family is messed up. So I won't be going down that road. I've always thought Chase was an interesting man. He's the same age as Dad, but still looks around my age, like some kind of vampire man. There's a total reasonable explanation for this, though. Chase has regenerative powers. He always has clear skin, silky hair and lots of stamina, which you can imagine comes in handy with his job. He's also really fast and hardly breaks a sweat. I'd love to see Joey race him someday. What's up with him? I blink a few times coming back to the room. Oh, Charles always going on into tangents within his own head. That explains to Bobby, whose hand I'm apparently still holding. I let go quickly and feel my cheeks start to blush. Oh, no, you don't. I cut that out immediately by pushing my blood away from that area. Come on, Charles, your interview is soon. Oh, yeah, that's why we're here. We say bye to Chase and Bobby and head over to the interview room. I hate wearing suits. It's so uncomfortable. They always grab you in the wrong places. I know you can buy fitted ones, but I'm not made of money. In fact, that's why I'm here right now, isn't it? The, to ace this interview. Get the job and earn myself some wonga. Come to think of it, what job am I even applying for? Excuse me, a random man approaches me. I can tell he's a man by the way the mug he's holding reads. Best man in show. Something tells me he is not. I motion to the seat next to me, assuming he wants to sit down. But alas, he remains standing above me. I ask him what he wants. Are you here for the interview? 
Nah, mate, I just wear suits to random businesses for fun. Seriously, though, what is this problem? I just don't remember approving you. What's that supposed to mean? Henry, this is my son Charles. He recently lost his job and I asked Merritt if he could come for an interview. Henry eyes me distastefully. I wouldn't have bothered, to be honest. I don't think you're what he's looking for. He better be joking. What do you mean by that? Dad challenges him on, his, on my behalf. Nothing, it's just... If you hadn't noticed, Merrick's tends to hire based on a certain set of credentials your son does not seem to possess. He disgustingly pretends to fondle his imaginary breasts. Is he for real? I beg your pardon. Dad is standing up now. Henry raises his hands defensively and backs away. I'm just warning you. He shrugs and turns it on his heels. I'm so sorry, Charles. That was abhorrent behaviour. Rest assured, I will tell Merrick as soon as we see him. Dad balls his fists in a way I've never seen him do before. That man thinks he's all that. He thinks he's so sly, but we all know he's seeing at least five women at the same time, most of whom are working in this very office. He takes a deep breath and relaxes his hands. I would say something. I should say something to them, but Henry has this way of making everyone side of him. They'd never believe me. I can't believe I'm the only one who can see it. I place my hand on top of his, look him in the eyes and assure him I see it too, and soon he will get exactly what's coming to his playing ass. We don't have to sit with this for long, because just as Dad comes back down to normal, a woman who I can only assume is Merrick's assistant steps out and calls me in. I'm beginning to wonder if she's one of Henry's girlfriends, and I look around the room at all the women going about their work here. I will find a way to stop him, I will find a way to help them, but for now I need to focus on my interview. Merrick is staring at my CV like he's making out with it. To be fair to him, he's a rather attractive man. You can see which side of the family Bobby Braskot gets his looks from. He's definitely a silver fox. I can't wait until Joey is a silver fox. That boy has been sipping from the same cup as Chase. He's eternally cute. It says here you studied cooking in college. Oh yeah, I forgot I did that. How will the skills you learned in that class help you here? He raises a brow awaiting an answer, being tested as the worst. I scroll through my brain seeking something clever to say, but instead I ramble about how all the ways to chop an onion somehow make me a good team player. He does not seem convinced, but attempts to move on before being interrupted by Henry barging through the door. Sir, I'm sorry to bother you. I know you're awfully busy, but it's Jacket. He's... he's fainted. Merrick gets up immediately, apologises and runs out the room. I know your game, young man. Henry is trying to threaten me. I don't need to act confused because I literally am. You want this job to steal my... I mean, to chat up all the women who work here, don't you? All I can say is, ill. Admit it. You can't fool me. I laugh awkwardly and assure him I've only got eyes for my Joey. He seems slightly taken aback by my response, as if he's never been heard of, even heard of a gay man before. I look him direct in the eyes. There's something about his eyes that feels familiar. He backs away without saying another word and slips out the door just as Merrick's returns, fuming for having been called away for no reason. The man must have a teleportation device or something because how else did he get up and down five to ten flights of stairs so fast? I can't sense his heart beating faster than expected, so he must know some good cardio workouts. I'll have to ask him for advice sometime. Hopefully the answer doesn't involve being rich or drinking some slimy green smoothie. I see Joey drink them all every morning, and I've never been so aroused and disgusted simultaneously in my whole life. Sorry about that. Merrick's re-enters the room, dusting off the imaginary dust from his blazer and straightening his tie. Where were we? I make a joke about me bombing the interview, and to my surprise, the man lets out a genuine laugh. <sighs> I'm not sure what your father has said about me, Charlie. I consider biting in and correcting him on my full name being Charlemagne, but I'm assuming this is just another test, so I let it slide, for now. But I haven't always been this successful. Is he about to start bragging? I see a lot of myself in you. I was just as nervous during my interview, and now look where I am. You could be running this company one day. Does this mean the interview is going well, or... We would love to have you on the team. He offers me his hand, just like that. There has to be a catch. There's no way I just got hired on the spot after the mess I've made of this interview. I question him on his decision, and he laughs. I wasn't offering you the job. It was just a general statement, but I admire how upfront you are. In my defence, he was being very misleading. I ask him why he offered me his hand and he laughs again. I was adjusting my cuffs, Charles. Let's continue properly, shall we? He 
He called me Charles, that's definitely a good sign. Maybe I can convince him to hire me with the power of laughter. He sits himself back down and inspects me closely. What do you value most in the world? Joey. Oh shoot, I said that out loud. Your boyfriend? I nod. I can respect that. Before I met Robert's mother, I had a boyfriend or five myself. Well, I suppose you would call them friends of benefits nowadays. He clears his throat, catching himself from making the conversation even more inappropriate than it was already becoming. Which floor was it again? Seventh? Chase pokes his head around the door. Speaking of... Merrick smutters to himself before sending Chase in the direction of the closest stairwell. Wait, does that mean Merrick's was with Chase after he and Dad broke up? Does that mean he really does have powers? Yes, I do. Merrick seemingly reads my mind. Well, turns out he can actually read my mind. Yes, I can. Scary. I'm not going to hire you just because you have special abilities. I didn't hire your father for his abilities either. But we are a naturally inclusive place here and do not discriminate based on who has powers and who doesn't. It's just dawning on me that from Chase alone, there could be almost a hundred powered individuals. I wouldn't worry about that, since we exchanged certain life-changing things with each other, and he got with his current boyfriend, he hasn't been able to pass anything on. I wouldn't trust him with my son otherwise. I want to ask him more about his mind-reading abilities and how that corresponds to him teleporting down to the ground floor, but of course there's no need. I didn't teleport, I just read Jacket's mind from the stairwell. That is impressive. Long-range mind reading. Thank you. Now can we please get back to the interview at hand? We laughed together before being interrupted yet again. Oh, for heaven's sake, Henry, what do you want? Merrick sleeps from his chair. I turn to see Henry standing awkwardly whilst glaring at me. I need to tell you something in private. He shuffles nervously. Can't it wait? Merrick's is on the verge of losing his temper. I see him narrowing his eyes, trying to burrow into Henry's mind, but it seems like he's failing. No, it can't, Henry insists. Merrick sighs, apologises and excuses himself, leaving me alone to twiddle my thumbs and an uncomfortable feeling that Henry is up to no good. But of course, there's no way to prove it. So instead, I'll just sit here and wait whilst I attempt to scratch away the skin-crawling sensation which has left me. Merrick has gone for a painfully long period of time, to the point my impatience has worn and my concern has deepened. I decide to risk it and investigate. To my surprise, there's nobody out on the office floor. When I come in, there were at least a dozen people working away at their desks, but now there is no one. Not even Dad is anywhere to be found. I reach for my phone and dial him, but he doesn't pick up. He always picks up. Something is definitely up. I run to the lift and head down to the ground floor, so my relief jacket is still at his desk. I ask him if he knows where everyone went, and he nods. Yeah, but he went for coffee or something. Left about half hour ago. I did think it was odd the floor going at once, but I'm not paid enough to care so. He shrugs, going back to typing on his computer. I know caffeine addiction is a thing, but a whole floor going at the same time and Henry deeming it important enough to interrupt our interview? It just doesn't add up. I push Jacket for more information, like where the nearest coffee place is, and he grunts at me. Go down to the end of the road. Turn left, you can't miss it. It's called the Bean Shed. I thank him, rush out the door and down the road. I get a stitch almost instantly. My body wasn't made to run. Thankfully, I can't lose my breath as I keep my heart at a sensible rhythm. I get to the bean shed, but nobody is inside, except for a guy carrying a travel tray full of coffees. Hey, he starts. How did your interview go? For a moment, I don't recognise his face, but then it hits me. He was standing near Bobby. He must be some kind of shooting assistant like a runner. Didn't know porn had those until now. I ask him if he knows where everyone is. Yeah, of course. They're all in the seventh floor as extras for the film. If that's the case, why the heck did Jacket send me here? Unless it was to get me out of the way. I charge back over to the building and slam my hands on the desk. Jacket looks generally confused. I didn't send you anywhere. What are you on about? I don't want to waste any more time, so I jump back into the lift and make my way to the seventh floor. Sure enough, everyone is here, even Dad and Merrick's. They both look dazed, but my dad quietly pulls me off to the side. Don't make any rash moves. Henry is holding everyone under some kind of trance. It doesn't affect me, but I'm trying not to draw attention to myself. I ask him what he means and he leans over to my ear. He's some kind of archetype. I've noticed a woman acting strange around him for weeks, but I assumed it was just because he was a misogynistic quint-timing jerk. Turns out they're in love with him. I ask if there's anything we can do, and Dad gives me a knowing smile. Don't worry, son. I have a plan. Dad's plan is pretty straightforward. It involves getting Henry away from the woman guarding him, and Dad using his charming power to get him to let everyone go. The question I'm asking myself is why now, and what is his end goal? Something tells me it has something to do with me showing up. He certainly didn't seem happy about it. 
like I was still some kind of threat, despite making it crystal clear that I'm fully and wholeheartedly devoted to my boyfriend, who I worship like a god. The only thing Dad hadn't figured out is how to break the woman away from Henry. They seem infatuated with him. In a state of deep thought, I look over to Bobby Brasscock, standing still shirtless, also entranced. Thank goodness he has some clothes on, though I wouldn't have minded the view. I asked Dad if he'll help, be able to help me move Bobby over towards the woman. He nods and we gently lift him off the ground. I'm surprised just how light he is. The man is all muscle. It must be part of the enchantment. Henry doesn't seem to notice. He's too busy being fed graves by one of Dad's co-workers, ancient Roman style. We place Bobby a few feet away from the woman and Dad uses his charming voice to draw their attention. Hey ladies, if you want a real man, look no further. I'm right here. The women snap their heads round and hiss. Some of them break off ready to attack Bobby, but I stand in their way as Dad slips past to get to Henry. Let them go, Dad demands with a silky voice. Henry is visibly fighting against his words. No, Dad keeps repeating himself over and over before becoming more and more aggressive. Until Henry's attention is snapped away for a split second, long enough for a couple of the women to regain their minds. What is going on here? One of them asked in the middle of reaching for my neck. I tell her Henry has been mind controlling them for months, and they turn on him. You jerk, you pig, leave him alone. Each expression is like a physical punch to Henry. With every call out, he moves his body as if he's being punched in the abdomen. Do you get your kicks preying on innocent women? More of the women are waking up now as Henry grows weaker and weaker. It's not long until everyone is freed from their trance. What the hell is going on here? Eric's demands, charging over to the scene. Henry here has been harassing, manipulating and cheating on my colleagues for who knows how long. Dad folds his arm. Henry, is this true? Something tells me the question didn't need to be asked. But I guess a boss has to have some form of impartiality. Henry looks up from the ground, clutching his stomach. I didn't think you could stoop any lower. You have been acting more and more disgusting for months. Don't think I haven't noticed. I'm shocked you weren't reported earlier. Months? I think to myself. Yes, months, Eric responds. There's been an archetype hanging about unnoticed for months. I knew this already, of course, but it's only now the longevity of months really hits me. How many more out there that have been fast festering for weeks, years even, that we aren't aware of? Marex has stepped out of my head now. I can sense him placing all his focus on Henry. You're fired, Henry. He lord sugars the man who begins crumbling to dust. I'm sorry, he whispers to the wind as he completely disappears and flows over to Dad. That's odd, Dad exclaims, looking at the bright pink broken heart symbol on his palm. We didn't even have to touch him to kill him. I guess it was his ego that was his downfall. What a big-headed jerk. He shrugs, walking away from the scene. Charles, I'm so sorry you witnessed this. I understand if you don't want the job. I look up at Merrick's with my mouth agape. Is he offering me the job? Not quite. I want to offer you a trial shift tomorrow to see how you get on. Seeing how you've no experience with being a PA before. Besides, it's the least I can do after this whole ordeal. Oh, so that's the job I was applying for. Merrick looks to me concerned, but I just pass it off as a joke and he relaxes. He walks away to check on his employees. Can everyone leave the set, please? We're trying to make a movie here. The porn director claps his hand. Yeah, and I really don't want my dad to see it. Bobby laughs uncomfortably, slipping on a robe. Everyone out, Merrick demands, and we all flood towards the lift. As I'm standing there squished between several people, I can't help but wonder just how many of them are just waiting to turn into archetypes. And what if one is someone I know?